Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm here with Manasi Vartak, who is going to give us a presentation, which is backed by popular demand from her AnacondaCon session. And before we get started, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. Your console is fully customizable, so feel free to expand or collapse any of the screens. And also, please type your questions into the Q&A panel. We'll be responding through the chat throughout the presentation. And you can also leverage the Virta Slack workspace, which is linked out in the console. Feel free to uh, join that as well and get connected with the rest of the community. And we will be sending out the recording for today's presentation, so you should receive that within the next couple of days. And at this time, I'll turn it over to you, Manasi. Hi, folks. Good morning. My name is Manasi Vartak. I am the founder and CEO of Virda.ai, and I'm thrilled to be here today speaking about a topic that is very close to my heart, namely how to make Python-based ML models reproducible. So super glad that you could join me. Um, and let me get started with a bit of background on me and why I'm really excited about this particular topic. So I did my PhD in computer science at MIT. My thesis work was on infrastructure for model management and diagnosis. So this was you know, several years back. Uh, folks were really getting into building a large number of models. And there were lots of questions around how to track these models, what do these models even mean, how do we deploy them, and so on. And a key part of my thesis work was developing this system called ModelDB. ModelDB is the first open source model management and versioning system. And the impetus for me in developing the system that I'll talk more about today was that as a data scientist, I was seeing a lot of people, including myself and researchers, building hundreds of models and yet not having a good way to manage, track, or version them. So I'll talk a lot more about that, uh, but that's a quick intro about me. I founded Verda based on my work at MIT. And what we do um, is that we build an ML ops platform, which means we take a model that has been trained, we bring it to production, we package it, deploy it, we make sure that it's scaling adequately up and down um, when it's deployed in a production setting, and we do so in a reliable and safe manner. So that's a bit about me. Um, let's dive into what today looks like. So the key thing that I want to talk about is model reproducibility. We'll get started with why model reproducibility is important. Second, we'll dive into what do you need to make a model reproducible? And how is this really different from code? What are the nuances that you need to be aware of? And then lastly, I'll use the last 10 minutes of my talk showing you hands-on how you can make your Python models reproducible with open source. In particular, I'll be talking about ModelDB, which I mentioned is a system we developed at MIT and continue to maintain at Verda. So with that, um, why do we care about ML model reproducibility, right? So I used to be a hands-on data scientist. I worked at some of the largest uh, tech companies, building models for content recommendation, ad recommendation, and so on. And what I saw over and over again was that model development is empirical, it's ad hoc. So that means you start off with a pristine looking model, you know, you're loading up some data, then you're doing feature assembly, um, then you're building a model. On iteration two or three, you have gone ahead and made some changes. There are new features that you're trying out. You're trying out a different type of classifier. A few more iterations down the line, we have a cleaner data set. We are also now doing a hyperparameter search. And it keeps building on top of each other until by the time we have our final model, maybe it's model 50, maybe it's model 100, we find that our code looks nothing like we started, our data likely looks nothing like we started with. And if you were asked, or if I was asked, how did this model come to be? Why did you make certain decisions? Or God forbid, can you go back and recreate a model? Um, I would have no way to answer that question. And what we noticed during the research for this, um, for the system was that this was a trend that we were seeing across the board. So these are some data points from Kaggle competitions. And in this table, we're showing you know, 10 odd Kaggle competitions and the number of submissions made by the top 10 contenders for this competition. 
And you will see the top data scientists are building and submitting hundreds of models. Note that these are not even the hyperparameter searches that you're doing. So if you look at the whole universe of models that are being built, that's closer to 1,000 or more. And so we're building a lot of models. However, when we think about um, how do we reproduce them or how do we track these models, the state of the art here looks um, abysmal. For instance, this is actually one of my folders. Um, we tend to come up with very interesting naming schemes for our folders. My final, final New Reps paper, uh, BERT final, final two. I tried this type of Euclidean or cosine distance and so on. Clearly not a very efficient way. In addition, it's also living on uh, my local drive. So if I were to switch jobs or something like that, uh, my colleague wouldn't be able to pick up where I left off. Another really interesting example is that of these comments in a Kaggle notebook. This particular data scientist is very, um, very methodically keeping track of all the changes that they were making to their notebook. As you might imagine, in software, this wouldn't fly um, at all. But in data science, we still think that it's OK to track our work in this manner. So if you're a researcher, um, you're already familiar with this. Making ML research reproducible is one of the key things that even Europe's conference is driving towards because we're finding that these models are becoming more black boxes. And so being able to probe into a model requires that we're actually able to figure out where the model came from and for someone else to rebuild their model to verify our research and for us to actually safely reuse a given model. But reproducibility is not just limited to academics. Um, if we are in a production environment, for instance, if we compare this to software engineering, um, suppose there is a null pointer exception in our production code, not ML related at all, just your web server or database server throws a null pointer exception. What we do today is that we can trace it back to a particular version of our web backend. Not only that, based on the identifier of that version, we can go back to our source version control and ask, hey, what changed between version XYZ and DEF? Because that's gonna tell me the reason why we're hitting this null pointer exception that we didn't hit before. Now, let's compare this to how things happen with ML. Suppose you have a model that has been trained on English tweets, um, it now gets German tweets. It has no idea what's going on. You find that your production model, model is behaving badly. In that case, right now, the best you can do is find out what is the artifact or what are the weights that this model has deployed. So maybe it's on S3 and it gives you a file. As a data scientist, that's not very helpful. I want to be able to go back and see what was the data that was used. Maybe there was something wrong with my data. Perhaps I was using a wrong version of a spacey model but without the ability to go back to the original ingredients of my model, I have no way to remedy this production incident. So while this is not directly reproducibility, it is the ability to reproduce a model that actually lets us remedy really important production incidents. Now, there's another use case that comes up a lot, um, which is reproducing analyses in regulated environments. So if you work in insurance, banking, um, whenever you submit a new model, the regulatory agency requires that you submit a report that explains what data was used, what features were used, what type of model was it, what sensitivity analyses did you do, and so on. And very often, once you submit this data, um, the regulatory agency is going to get back to you several months from now asking you, hey, how does this apply for this particular cohort of users? Why did you make a particular decision? If your data science process doesn't have the checks and balances in place, um, and many of the folks that we interact with don't have that in place, data scientists will spend months trying to answer these regulatory queries and often get slapped with fines that are six or seven figures just because they didn't have a way to reproduce their old analyses. The last one that explains the reason why we should make our models reproducible is something that I think everyone in this room is familiar with. Suppose you're working on a data science team. Um, Jill works on a lead scoring model. 
And her models, you know, are in S3, not on a local drive, but even no idea how they came about, as is quite usual. And then Jill unfortunately gets laid off because of COVID or just decides that she's going to move to a different company. Now you're tasked with picking up her work, maintaining it and improving it without a way to figure out, you know, to learn from Jill and get all of her code on why this model came to be. You're out of luck and you will likely need to end up starting from scratch in building this model. We see this over and over again, and in these COVID-19 times, we've been getting a lot of asks around, hey, how do we organize our work? We're remote, we have had to downsize our teams. Um, how do I make sure that the data science ML knowledge is still preserved across the organization? So if you need one reason to make your models reproducible, this is one of the best ones um, that I can point you to. So to summarize, um, regardless of what domain that you're working in, supporting reproducible and high quality research, ensuring reliability of models in production, <clears throat> enabling easy audits of data, enabling sharing and collaboration are all the reasons why um, we need to care about model reproducibility. Um, and I'm glad that you're in this talk to figure out collectively how we can bring best practices for model reproducibility into the wider data science community. So hopefully I've convinced you that model reproducibility is important. Um, in the next part of the talk, I'm gonna dig deeper into what does it take to make ML models reproducible, right? So I always, use, I always like to start with, what is a model? We wanna make this thing reproducible, but what is this thing that we're talking about? And I got asked this question um, at my thesis proposal defense, and that is not the time when you wanna get asked such a fundamental question. Um, but the thing is like, everyone in the, data, in the data science community defines models differently, whether it's a function, it's a set of weights, it's an object in Python, it's a data processing operator, so on and so forth. Everyone has their own definition. So for the purposes of this talk and a definition that we've seen to work very well in the field is that a model is an artifact. It's like a file, a blob. It could be a set of weights. It could be the saved model, the pickle file, um, PMML, Onyx, you know, one of these interchange formats. The key thing is that the model has been generated by some sort of training process and it can do some ML task. Maybe that's a regression, maybe that's a classification, really up to the model. But for us, a model is an artifact. So when we think about a model is an artifact, the question is really how do we make this particular, how do we make this particular model reproducible? So what ingredients do we need to make this happen? So if we look at software, um, our artifact in software is this binary executable, or it could be the container that you ultimately deploy. And when we're trying to make software reproducible, what we're really saying is, so long as we have the source code, our software is reproducible because we can always go from the source code to the binary to the container. So if we draw a parallel to machine learning, we're saying in machine learning, our weights and checkpoints are really the place that we care about. Those are our artifacts. If we wanna make them reproducible, it means that we need to travel back to the ingredients of our models. So in order to make models reproducible, what we're gonna do is we're gonna make sure we keep track of and we snapshot all of these ingredients that produce a particular modeling artifact. So with that, that was a hypothesis we started off with um, during my work on MIT. Um, and we started looking at what are the ingredients that impact the reproducibility of the model? So some of these are fairly standard and should be obvious. There's code, um, models are trained via code. So in order to reproduce a model, we actually need the code that trained it. Second, configuration. These are your hyperparameters. Um, you can also put in different kinds of information in configuration if you like. Maybe it's details of your pipeline, um, maybe it's something related to the kind of algorithm you're using. Fairly flexible, we call it configuration um, because these are the knobs that you tune and you can't re, you cannot guess those knobs based on just your model. The third one is the data um, and all of us have been bitten by 
we were using this particular version of our data set. Uh, we went off and deleted that file and our model no longer <laughs> trades. In that case, we need to track all the changes that we're making to the data. And so the third ingredient of the model that we require is data. The last one is environment. And the Python crowd would, will in particular appreciate this very much because Python libraries, Python library versions are really crucial um, in being able to reproduce any kind of code that's written in Python. So the sum total is that in order to reproduce our models, we require to keep track of four ingredients. These are our code, our config, data, and environment. If we're storing, if we're snapshotting each one of these ingredients, then we have everything we need to reproduce a model. So if you have a scikit-learn model, for instance, we want to know the training code. We want to know the hyperparameters. We want to know what CSV file you trained on. We want to know what version of pandas, what version of scikit-learn, et cetera, were used in order to create this model. So that's pretty obvious. Um, we now have a good grasp on what we need to store. The thing is, we're not just building one model. We're building hundreds of these models. So that means we are storing these ingredients over and over and over and over again for each of the models that we're building. Now, you might ask, well, we just care about the final model. That's what you think when you're starting out. However, you want to go back and see what changed between version 3695 and 3694. If you don't have these ingredients for every version, you're going to have a hard time figuring out what changed. And so the scalability of a system for reproducibility becomes very important. We don't want to keep storing the code over and over again. We don't want to store the data over and over again. Imagine a terabyte of data that you are copying just because you want to get reproducibility. So those are the trade-offs that we need to consider uh, when we think about making our models reproducible. Luckily for us, we've already solved this problem um, in code. Um, we have made code reproducible via our version control systems. And that's how um, we've been able to get software to the place that it is today. So if the way to enable reproducibility is via version control systems, and we've done that for code, the takeaway for us is if we want to make ML reproducible, we need to do the same thing. We need to have a robust and scalable model version control system. In code, we're snapshotting the code. In model version control, we actually need to snapshot all of these four ingredients that we're talking about, that we were talking about earlier, and we need to do that in a scalable fashion. So the question um, that comes up very often is, hey, we have Git, or you know, your favorite version control system. Why don't we just use that in order to make our model version control system? There are a few reasons. Some of them have to do with how Git is designed. Some of them have to do with how data science is done. So first of all, Git is fantastic for code, not for data. Uh, model versions require both code and data and more, as we have seen. In terms of features, we as data scientists don't always work at a command line where we're creating a branch for every particular experiment that we're doing. Um, it's much more ad hoc. It's much more freeform. And any model version control system needs to be able to adapt to that flow of work. We also need to be able to keep track of commits and branches we created, even though they were unsuccessful, because they're an important data point into why a final model was picked ultimately. And finally, there are some performance challenges that come up um, relating to large data files, Git being distributed and every user needing to have the full repository history when using a Git repo. Git is a great building block for a model version control system. However, an ideal model version control system needs to have other belts and whistles. It needs to have ways to compensate for these performance and feature drawbacks of Git. So next, I'm going to talk about how we architected ModelDB. Um, and then I will switch very quickly into a hands-on demo of ModelDB so that when you leave from this talk, we, you can go off and uh, try it yourself. 
So Model DB is the open source project we built at MIT, and now we maintain it at Verna. It is a system for model versioning and management. There are a few details that are different between versioning and management. Happy to discuss that in um, the Q&A. But what ModelDB provides is Git-like constructs for versioning all model ingredients. Whether it's commits, forks, merges, um, you want the ability to go back to, say, a particular version of your data set, you can do that. You want to go back to a particular version of your environment, that's fine, you can do that too. In addition, our, our research into the space indicated that Along with versioning models, there's metadata that is really key for models, whether it's the artifacts that we're generating, the metrics, charting, and visualizations. So we baked that in um, so that users could just use one particular system to track and manage their models. As I mentioned, ModelDB is open source. That's the link to it, uh, github.com, vert.ai, ModelDB. You can also Google ModelDB, um, and you should be able to find it. So a bit about its architecture. Um, it goes back to the key design constraints that we have for a model version control system. So model DB is what we call a super repo. Um, that means there's a model DB repo. However, inside of it, we have four key repos. There's one repo that handles code. There's one repo that handles data. There's one repo that handles config and another one that handles environment. What does that mean? It means for capturing code and versioning it, we actually fall back to Git. Git is amazing at keeping track of your code, making it reproducible. We use Git. For data, suppose your data lives on S3, then ModelDB works along with S3 to create snapshots of your data in an efficient manner um, and adding the ability to go back in time to do merges, to do forks, et cetera, on top of that data. For the config and environment, we have lightweight constructs that have been built into ModelDB so that you don't need to change the way that you are building your ML models. Continue to use Git. If you're not using Git, highly, highly recommend that you do. Um, and wherever your data is stored, we can adapt to it and make sure that we can version the data itself. So what does a ModelDB version look like, you might ask? As I mentioned before, ModelDB is a super repo. So Model DB repo exists, there are commits in that repo, but every commit in model DB is actually associated with commits across these four repos. So there might be a training repo that has its own individual commit ID, code repo, similarly config and environment repo. So this hierarchical system really allows us to figure out where changes are happening. And it allows us to support constructs like forking very easily. Maybe you just wanna change the data you want to keep the rest of your ingredients the same. Maybe you want to change the code and config while keeping data the same. So that's what you can do. Once you have forked um, your code, you can go back, you can merge it because we want to collaborate. We want to share our work. And this is a way that we can always be sure that we can go back, we can pull in changes that we think are improving our model and we can do this in an efficient manner. So that's really an a whirlwind overview of model DB. So what I'm going to do next is walk you through how you can make your Python models reproducible using model DB open source. And that link down there um, has instructions for you to follow along as I am demonstrating the use of model DB. Those instructions are going to be available even after the talk. Um, so feel free to do that later. My team does periodic model DB tutorials that we would be glad um, to have you join us at. So I'll leave that information towards the end of the talk, but I'll leave that on there for just another uh, couple of seconds so that folks can navigate to that website. Okay, let's keep going. All right, so what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna do a walkthrough of the following. I'm gonna show you how to instrument your model code to be reproducible. This is gonna capture all the ingredients that we need to make your models reproducible. Then I'm gonna show you via the Model TV web app how you can see all of the previous versions of your model, how you can go back to previous versions very easily, and how does branching, merging, things like that look like on Model TV. 
So this is a very simple example. What we're doing here is we are downloading some data, which is our census data set. It's a tabular data set. I have a bunch of columns. I'm predicting this last column that is a um, zero one attribute. So just gonna scroll down here, bunch of columns. I'm predicting this last column, which is did a particular individual make greater than 50K a year, less than 50K, and we're using different kinds of demographic information to make that prediction. And the key part for us here is to make sure that any model that we're building is actually reproducible. So how do we do that? Um, you should be able to run all of this independently once you have model DB open source set up. So I'll only highlight the key pieces that are different when you are creating models using model DB. So first of all, ModelDB is a client service system. So I'm doing a bit of setup. I'm telling it my model is running on our hosted version. You would be running a local host uh, when you're using the OSS version. I'm giving it some metadata. I'm working on the AnacondaCon reproducible ML demo, just some organization so that I can go and find it later. I'm importing a bunch of things, nothing fancy. Um, then I am also creating a repository as I mentioned, ModelDB is a super repo. So we need to tell ModelDB, hey, I'm working on this particular repo, give it the name AnacondaCon demo. I wanna be, I wanna create a branch, which is my master branch, and then fork off to create a new branch, which is my logistic regression branch. Assume I'm building a logistic regression model uh, for the purpose of this demo. So I'm doing that. I have a branch now, I have a commit. Perfect, let me keep going. I'm downloading data from S3, as I mentioned. Um, census train, census test, just downloading it, nothing super fancy. Then I'm opening up that data set using pandas. I'm looking at it, making sure it makes sense. You might have some feature pre-processing in here, whatever is appropriate for your use case. Then I'm defining my hyperprams. Don't have a ton here. This is a uh, logistic regression model. So I have a solver, maximum iteration, C values, um, the usual suspects. So at this point, I've really set up everything that I need to train my model. Now, this is where the versioning comes in. Uh, this is where reproducibility comes in. Before you actually begin to train the model, you wanna capture the state of the system because you want it to be as close as possible to when you train the model so that reproducing it becomes super, super easy. For instance, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go back to the four ingredients that we discussed, the code, the config, data, and environment, and I'm gonna capture them exactly as they are right now. You can think of this as snapshotting each of these um, ingredients. It's not quite the same, uh, there are some details in there. So what I'm doing here is I'm telling ModelDB, I'm working on a notebook, get me all the information about my code from the notebook. I have a Git repo backing it. So it's also gonna capture information about the Git repo. It's gonna capture the hyperparameters that I had set out up here. It's gonna capture and snapshot the data set on S3. So I'm saying, this is my S3 data set, my bucket name, my file name, please go off and uh, snapshot it, version it. And then I'm on a Python environment, so I need you to go and find the libraries I'm using, Python version, everything I need to make the environment reproducible. So that's where I've gotten all of the ingredients of the model um, already set up. And then I create a commit with all of those ingredients. And there's details here that um, I'm gonna skip over. They're not super key. I'm happy to go over them during the Q&A. Essentially, I've captured all the details of the ingredients. I have created a commit. After that, I can go off. I can do my modeling as usual, train test splits. I have a logistic model. I'm fitting it. Wonderful. I figure out how well the model is doing, um, and I log the metric. So I store the metric back to ModelDB because reproducibility is great, but I also want to know how well the model did. So that's where the logging metric helps us store that information back. And then I associate the actual model, the artifact with that commit. So I can quickly see this particular commit created this artifact, all right, I have a one-to-one -one mapping. So I've gone ahead and I have trained this model. <clears throat> I've also versioned it on ModelDB. 
I won't rerun it for sake of time. I'll just show you what it looks like um, in the Model DB web app. So switching over here, this is the web interface for Model DB accessible to you guys when you um, download and set up the system. Here's the project that I'm working on. Um, I'm gonna quickly refresh to make sure we're all good. Perfect. Um, reproducible ML demo. I can go in here, I can see all of the models that I trained. So this is telling me I have four models trained. Right now I was doing a hyperparameter sweep before. Great, that's wonderful. I can click in here. Um, I can see what was the run ID, what was the experiment, what was the project. I'm gonna come back to versions in just a second. It shows me the hyperparams were used, the metrics, the artifacts that I stored, everything that I might want about this model. Now coming to the key part, the versioning. What we wanna do is we wanna have the exact snapshots of all of our ingredients at the time that we train the model. So let's see if we have them. So for hyperparameters, let's see if we've gotten the exact hyperparameters that were used. Um, yes, we do. We have a C value solver, we have a max iter, wonderful. We might wanna see what my Python environment looked like when I actually built this model. Here it's telling me we picked up a Python version of 3.6.3. Here are the exact requirements with dependency pins. So this was the state of your machine, really, when you built the model. And so you can always reproduce it to a T. The last one is the data set itself. Um, if you look at the data, it's gonna tell us that it's an S3 data set. Um, its size was so-and-so, we snapshotted it, it was last modified, this was a checksum. So if you wanted to go back and go to a previous version of the data set, you always have the ability to do that via this interface. Finally, suppose that we, were, we had this data set um, and we wanted to see how my data set had changed over time. In that case, because we are versioning or snapshotting every change in the data, you can go back and see what changed in your S3 bucket. So this is the difference between version four and five. Um, and it's telling me that we removed a particular file from S3. So even if it's a file level change or entirely changing, removing a file, it's gonna tell you so that you can make sense of what changed between two different models. Finally, um, we think that there's a lot of metadata that's important with models. Usually those are metrics, things like that. And we found that just the ability to chart things helps you, um, helps you to keep track of how you're doing over time. So that's the metadata piece. The last one I'll mention here before wrapping up is this repo construct. So I'm gonna dig a little bit deeper and kind of show you what that looks like. So this is our model DB repo. We had created two branches, if you remember. There was a master branch that was a logistic regression branch. On the logistic regression branch, I can see the history of all the models that I tried. Here, I just have four. So I have four of these hyperparameter runs. I can go and see what changed between um, consecutive commits. So I can go see, all right, the notebook seems to have changed slightly. My config is very different. So I can diff two, uh, two models very easily. Going back, ultimately, you don't wanna store hundreds of these models in different branches. What you wanna do is you wanna pick the best one and then merge it in a master. So the way that you can do that is you pick a branch, um, you say, hey, I wanna compare it to master. That's wonderful, this makes sense to me. This is the data set, this is my hyperparams, um, great, I wanna merge it. And that's it. What that's gonna do is it's gonna pick up all the changes that we care about and it's gonna store them on master so that now if you look at the history of master, you can see here are all the experiments that I did. At any point I can go and I can see here's what, here's what I tried. Um, that's great. And because everything is tied back to this original abstraction of a run, you can go backwards and forwards from here's my commit to a run and you can go from here's my run and here's how I can reproduce it. So that was a very quick whirlwind tour of ModelDB. There's a lot more info here, a lot more features that we find useful in reproducing models. Um, but for the purpose of this talk, I'm gonna leave the demo here 
happy to take questions um, in the last few remaining minutes. So let me transition back to my, um, my keynote for a second. So what we did right now was a qu quick run through um, that goes through a lot of the key operations that we do in Model TV. What does this mean, right? This is a cool tool, why do I care? Well, suppose you're a researcher and you wanna make your models reproducible, all you need to do is you need to create and share a Model DB repo. Create a repo, give your colleagues a link, they can explore it, they can reproduce all of your models. You don't need to actively do anything anymore. If you're in production, every model gets a unique SHA or an identifier similar to code, so that if something goes wrong in production, you can always go back and see what changed. You can roll back to an ease, um, a more stable version that you have previously deployed. If you want to reproduce analyses because you're in a regulated setting, same drill, just create a model DB repo and you'll be able to recreate all the analyses that you did there. And finally, if you want to make sure that you can share your data science and ML knowledge, that's where working, similar to working on one Git repo when you're doing a software project, we can have a shared Git repo per project. And so if Jill goes off, um, to work in another company or is laid off, you can always go and see her work and then pick up uh, the pieces that are most relevant. So with that, let me summarize what, what we've covered today. First of all, hopefully I've convinced you that model reproducibility is essential, whether in research, production, regulated settings, everyday data science. We have realized that these models are getting used in so many different areas that we need to be much more much more disciplined um, and our models need to be much more reliable given the impact that they're having and reproducibility is how we get there. Next, we talked about how in order to reproduce models, we need to version all the model ingredients. This includes code, config, data, and environment. If we skip any of these, we don't have model reproducibility. Third one, just a parallel. We don't write code without a version control system. We shouldn't create models without a version control system either. And finally, I walked you through ModelDB, an open source model versioning and management system that we built originally at MIT and now maintain at Verda, which we found to be extremely effective in making models reproducible. So with that, thanks very much for your time um, and appreciate you joining in for this remote conference. Thank you.